عظم الله أجورنا وأجوركم بمصاب أمير المؤمنين سيدي سيدي ومولاي لقد ضاقت القلوب واشتدت المحن بفراقك يا علي روى شيخ الكلين بسند معتبر عن أبي جعفر الباقر عليه السلام قال لما قبض أمير المؤمنين عليه السلام قام الحسن بن علي في مسجد الكوفة فحمد الله وأثنى علي وصلى على النبي ثم قال أيها الناس إنه قد قبض في هذه الليلة رجل ما سبقه الأولون ولا يدركه الآخرون إنه كان لصاحب لصاحب رسول الله راية رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله عن يمينه جبرائيل وعن يساره ميكائيل أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وبه نستعين وأفضل الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الخلق والمرسلين حبيب إله العالمين المؤيد أحمد أمجد أبو القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين واللعنة الدائمة السرمدية الأبدية على أعدائهم إلى قيام يوم الدين والحمد لله الذي جعلنا من المتمسكين بولاية سيدي ومولاي أمير المؤمنين مولى الموحدين إمام المتقين الصديق الأكبر فاروق هذه الأمة أسد الله الغالب غالب كل غالب علي بن أبي طالب الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا أن نهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله I greet you all with the Islamic greeting. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The first salawat is in the honor of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Sallu ala Muhammad wa alayhi wa sallam. The second is in the honor of Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali bin Abi Talib alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa alayhi wa sallam. The third is the honor of the Imam of our time, Imam Al Hajj Abdullah Faraj Al Sharif. When it comes to Ali bin Abi Talib, there are two main groups that deviated from him, and we find in within the Muslim Hadith corpus, so the books of the Shia and the books of Ahlul Sunnah, where there is a, there is quotations, narrations from Imam Ali himself, where he talks about these two deviant sects and how they deviated from him and why they deviated from him. I'll quote the first one from Nahj al balagha the book of Sharif al radi He says, Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam said, Two categories of people will face ruin on account of me. He who loves me with exaggeration and he who hates me intensely. So you have the Nawasib, the Khawarij that hated Imam Ali. It was part of their belief, part of their culture to hate Imam Ali. Then you had those that went to the extreme. They gave attributes to Imam Ali as if he's a god as if he's a lord. You have those that worshipped him. In history, for example, were famously known as the Sabaiya, 
we came from a man called Abdullah bin Saba. Actually, what's found in our books is that he was one of the first people to start, or if the if not the first person to start the exaggeration in the love of Amir al muminin In Musad Ahmad bin Hanbal, in a Sahih Hadith or Hassan Hadith, sorry, um, meaning it's a good chain. That means the chain was transmitted with a good chain. The individuals in the um, chain are trustworthy or to be, or the hadith is to be accepted. He quotes Ahmad bin Hanbal from Rasulullah. He says, the Prophet told Ali, there is in you the like of Isa. The Jews hated him so much, hated him to such an extent that they slandered his mother. The Christians loved him so much to an extent that they raised him to a status that he is not deserving of. Then Ali, so Imam Ali says, two types of people will be ruined because of me. Someone who's extreme in their love for me. Those that exaggerated my virtues of me, which I do not possess. And someone who is extreme in their hatred, causing him to slander me. Subhanallah. Look at the two extremes. See how someone can go so far. And we see this now. If we look at social media, you might even see some people, you know, they look like sheikhs, they're wearing turbans, and they'll tell you that Ahl al-Bayt give rizq, Ahl al-Bayt create. This is absolutely false. It goes against Ahl al-Bayt in every shape or form. And this is what it means to go to the extreme when it comes to Ahl al-Bayt, or in our case, Imam Ali alayhi salam. In another hadith that's found in Kitab Fadail al-Sahaba, again by Ahmed bin Hanbal, or Kitab al-Sunnah by Ibn Abi Asim, um, the grading has been graded as Sahih by Al-Albani. He says, it's from Imam Ali again as well. A people will love me until they enter the hellfire due to their extreme love for me. Allahu Akbar. So he's saying these individuals will go to hell because of their extreme love for me. And then he continues, and a people will hate me until they enter the hellfire due to their hatred for me. So we as Shia need to find the balance. We need to be in the middle. We need to go to Imam Ali through the middle. We can't be extreme and we can't, of course, hate him. There is a very important quote, statement by one of the Sahaba or one of the companions, sorry, of Imam al-Sadiq. Now, everything that I'm doing I'm trying to get to a certain point. I'm building everything together. I'll explain as I'm going, inshallah. His name is Abam bin Taghlib. Famous um, among the Ahlul Sunnah, even in the classical times, in the early generations, and of course in our books. He says, and, the had, uh, and this narration is actually found in a book, a Shi'i book, called Fahrist al-Najashi. He's a 5th century scholar. Okay? So he says, O Abba Bilad, Abba Bilad is a contemporary of Abba bin Taghlib. I've cut out, I'm only using the last part of the report because I'm trying to get, uh, I just want to focus on these words. He says, oh Abba Bilad, do you know who the Shia are? So when someone asks you, who are the Shia? Give them the reply of Abba bin Taghlib. Look what he says. Oh Abba Bilad, do you know who the Shia are? The Shia are those who follow the opinion of Ali when quotations from the Prophet contradict. Why? Why is there a contradiction when it comes to the hadith of Rasulullah? Few reasons. One, some of the companions could have lied against Rasulullah. We've seen that happen. Second one, Rasulullah gave a certain hukum in the morning. Okay. And then at night, that hukum changed. But this Sahabi heard it in the morning, but he didn't hear it at night. So the hukum has changed. So now there's a contradiction. And there could be a one Sahabi, he heard the hadith, didn't really understand it. So he narrates the hadith wrong. The other Sahabi hears it, but he narrates it correct. There's a contradiction. 
He's saying when the Shia are those who follow the opinion of Ali, when there's a contradiction. He continues, and the opinion of Ja'far bin Muhammad as Sadiq, when quotations from Ali are contradictory. SubhanAllah. Why is there a contradictory when it comes to Imam Ali as well? Now we have two obstacles. Obstacle one, we have Rasulullah, because at the end of the day, our main objective is to reach Rasulullah, to reach the words of Rasulullah, the Sunnah of Rasulullah. The first obstacle, okay, now we have a few contradictions because of some Sahaba that might have lied or misunderstood or didn't hear the hukum that changed. Now we have Imam Ali that will tell us what to do when it comes to the Sunnah, who was right and who was wrong. He said, no, there's also another obstacle now. Where they're quoting from Ali and they're contradicting. Why? Those that hate Ali, what did they do? They lied against Ali. Those that loved Ali so much to the extreme, what did they do? They also lied against Imam Ali alayhi salam. So now there's a problem, an obstacle to get to the sunnah of Rasulullah. Because now we have obstacle one, Imam Ali. Before Imam Ali obstacle, then Imam Ali. Then an obstacle between Rasulullah so now where, how do we reach the point where we are going to get to the sunnah of Rasulullah? So there's a hadith found in the books of Ahl sunnah You can find the hadith in the tafsir of Ibn Kathir. Some, for some reason, say Ibn Kuthair, but it isn't, it's Ibn Kathir. Um, you can also find the similar wording in tafsir al-Tabari. And al-Hakim narrates it also with different wording. Now these are all major Sunni scholars. Classical scholars, they narrate, they say, Imam Ali climbed the pulpit in Kufa. Listen to this now. And he said, so he climbed the pulpit in Kufa and he said, you will not ask me about any verse in the book of Allah or about any sunnah from the messenger of Allah, except that I will inform you about that. He's saying, I have absolute understanding of the Quran and Sunnah. I say, Ya Nas, Ya Alam, Ya Ma'shar al Muslimin, find me one Sahabi that's ever said, I have complete knowledge of the Quran and Sunnah. Do you know what that means? That means Abam bin Takhlib was correct to say, when quotations from Rasulullah contradict, there is only one man that can solve that contradiction is Ali bin Abi Talib. But then there was another problem that occurred because of those that went to the extreme with their love to Imam Ali and those that hated Imam Ali. They built another obstacle to get to the man that had absolute knowledge of the Quran and Sunnah. And what and how did Abu bin Taghlib solve it? He says you go to who? Ja'far bin Muhammad as-Sadiq alayhi salam. You go back to the children of Ali. You go back to the Imma of Ahl al-Bayt alayhum as -salam. Where am I getting to? I'm going bit by bit. I'm trying to explain. There's a very important point. So we know the famous hadith. Ana madinatul ilm wa aliyun babuha. So when we say ana madinatul ilm wa aliyun babuha, I say this. I say true. No doubt. There is only one gate that truly, un there's only one gate that you go through to have absolute understanding of the Quran and Sunnah. That is the gate of Ali. But sometimes you're lost. You don't know how to get to the gate. There is only a handful of people that will take you to that gate. They are the people of guidance. They are the imma of Ahl al-Bayt alayhum as -salam. They are Muhammad bin Ali. Ja'far bin Muhammad, Musa al-Kadhim, Ali al-Rudha, Muhammad al-Jawad, Ali al-Hadi, Imam al-Askari, al-Hujjah, and Imam Zain al-Abidin, of course, and al-Hassan wa al-Hussein. So, ana madinatul ilm wa aliyun babuha. It explains what Imam Ali was saying. I have absolute knowledge of the Quran and Sunnah. He can, he's the only one that can be the gate to the city of knowledge. But sometimes on your way to that city, you need, in our day, Google Maps, Waze, I don't know what, what, what everyone uses in Holland. There's a way to get there. 
And the people that will guide you there are the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. More specifically, Imam Al-Baqir was Sadiq Which leads to which leads me to a very important point, which is the main part of my lecture, which is we are trying to get back to Amir al muminin And in these nights, we are remembering the istishad of Amir al muminin There is only one way to truly get to the true self of Amir al muminin Without any taqsir, without any ghulu, without any um, exaggeration or lies against him. And that is to refer back to the books of hadith. The Shi'i Imami books of Hadith. Why? Because majority of these books of Hadith were compiled for one reason. To transmit to us, that the people that live in this generation, to transmit to us after 1,400 years, these words of the Imams to help us reach the man that had absolute knowledge of the Quran and Sunnah. The man that had absolute understanding of the words of Rasulullah, of the Quran. And we have to refer back to these books. Of course, we're not saying any, every book in, in, in within the Shia corpus is infallible, has no mistakes. No, there's a certain process that you go through. Let it be. They are called the, sci the sciences of hadith. But generally speaking, the main objective of these books is the compilers were trying to compile as much as they can the words of Ahl al-Bayt so that we are able to go back to the main objective, the Quran and Sunnah. And then, why are we trying to reach the Quran and Sunnah? Because we are all trying to reach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. So now that we've understood, just so that we're all on the same page, we are trying to reach Rasulullah. There was an obstacle. Then you have Imam Ali alayhi salam. There was an obstacle um, to get to Imam Ali. Now we have to get to the likes of Al-Baqir and Al-Sadiq, who majority of our hadith corpus, our books of hadith, narrate from these two imams. Of course, we have reports from the other imams, but I think more than 65 to 70% come from Imam Al-Baqir and Al-Sadiq, alayhum salam So, what I'm about to do is give a very, very brief introduction to the books of hadith. Why? We as Shia have absolutely, and I'm sorry to say it, and I mean it with no disrespect, we have failed the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. In what sense? When I'm in a big gathering and I sit there and I say, Brothers, put your voices down. Let me ask you a question. They go, What? I say to them, Do you know who here knows Sahih al Bukhari? Everyone puts their hands up. Okay. Who here knows Kitab al-Kafi, the most authoritative Shia book of Hadith? Three, four hands. Shocking. That means you don't even know much about the Imams. And you don't even, you're not even trying to get to the thing that is the closest thing that we have to the Ahl al-Bayt, which is their words that has been transmitted to us. So this is an introduction level. So inshallah, when you have time, you can be like, Oh, you know what? I'll go back to this lecture and okay. Oh, he mentioned this book. Let me have a bit of a research. Oh, maybe I can find it on Thakalain, as the brother was mentioning before I came um, to lecture. These things you start to read. I'm not saying sit there and, you know, for you to become the, the next, say, the Sistani, but read the book. You want to become familiar with the Imams? You love Ahl al Bayt? You have to know about them. Just like. When you're about to marry a person, you need to know everything you, you want to know to know you're going to have a successful life. We know success in this life and the next is for us to go back to Ahlul Bayt, for us to go back to the Quran in Ahlul Bayt. So let's do that. So I will, I will split the uh, main part of the lecture into three parts. The first part will be the books of the Imma. It's going to be very brief. If you want to take notes on your phone, please do so. I think it's very important. So you have the first part, the books of the Imams. So the actual books of the Imams. Um, and then the second part will be a brief discussion about the books of the companions of the Imam that did not reach us. I'll give a few examples. And then the books that did reach us. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. 
So the first book that we will discuss is the book um, is called Al Jamia. So it's some riwayat is known as Kitab Ali or Al Al Sahifa. Um, it's basically Imam Ali narrating everything from Rasulullah. When you go back to the books of Hadith, you're going to see something. You're going to see Imam al Sadiq saying "Qala Rasulullah," and you know. Imam al-Sadiq died in the second century. How is he narrating from Rasulullah? He had a book. It's called Kitab Ali al-Jami'ah. This book is everything that Imam Ali, when he, heard, when he hears something from Rasulullah, he would write it down. The Imams used to use it in matters of fiqh um, and to talk about the seer of Rasulullah, the different events. Because sometimes they'll come to Imam al-Sadiq, for example, and they'll say, oh, but there was this... Um, they said that this incident happened and this is what happened. Imam al-Sadiq would say, no, this is not what happened. He goes to the book of Ali, opens it up and will be like, yep, yeah, this is what happened. So he had a book where he was able to tell the people what happened in the time of Rasulullah because Imam Ali was writing everything. As a, as a um, school of thought, we are the people that transmitted our Torah through writing, through books. We didn't transmit the Sunnah of Rasulullah verbally. It was all writing it down from the Imams. Alayhim so this book um, used to use it also to prove that they are the true successors. That only an Imam will be able to have this book. Now, of course, the book itself didn't reach us because it will only be with the, uh, the Imam, the Ma'soom. But we have obviously narrations or fiqhi rulings or matters in the seerah that reached us because the imam is narrating from the book. Now, there is a small opinion. I thought I'll add it just, just so people know. Um, there are some scholars that say um, al-jami'ah, kitab al-jami'ah, or al-jami'ah is not kitab Ali. They're two different things. There's a bit of a discussion. We don't need to get into it. Um, the second book is al-jaf. Now, it's... In the Ruwayat, it mentions it's made out of leather. Other reports say it's leather, uh, the leather of a bull. Okay. Um, in some reports, it talks about that there's three different types of Al Jaf. Very important book. Um, there's one where it says the red Jaf, the one, the other one says the white, the other one says the major Jaf. Bit of a discussion, we don't need to get into it. It's just something so we could be like, oh, okay, there's a book. That the Imams have. I'm just trying to introduce you to it. I don't want it to become, you know, a Hawza lesson or anything like that. So we're keeping it brief, inshallah. Then you have Mus'haf Fatima. So in the Ahadith, it says it's, it's uh, by the way, we always get accused of, oh, they have a different book. It's called Mus'haf Fatima. No, it's just Mus'haf linguistically just means, you know, um, compilation of scrolls or something along them lines. It doesn't mean another Mus'haf, another Quran. The book is, um, as mentioned in the Ruwayat, it's three times the size of the Qur'an. Um, and basically what happens is, it was when Rasulullah died, Sayyidah Zahra was in so much grief that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Jibra'il to make her feel better. And he would tell her, in the book, basically it's Imam Ali writing what Jibra'il was saying to Sayyidah Zahra. Now some of us might be a bit shocked, like, what do you mean, are they... So they, they see angels? No. In our ahadith, we say that the imams and say the Zahra and of course Rasulullah is there's, um, the muhaddathun. Okay, so that means they are people that can hear the um, angels. So there's three different categories in our ahadith. The messenger can see, hear the angel. The prophet can either get it through a dream um, or hear the angel The muhaddath can Only hear the angel So for example Say the Maryam Or the mother of Musa alayhi salam Something like that So she was sad he would come And he was telling her about the future events What will happen The names of the successors of Rasulullah So the 12 Imams Who we'll also talk about um, the descendants Of Sayyidah Zahra and what will happen to them The names of the Shia all of these facts and Imam Ali is listening and taking notes. So 
that's part one. The there's a few maybe other books, but there's a bit of a discussion on the attribution or can we even prove it. So I'm just going by what's generally accepted. Then you have um, the books of the Ashab. So the companions of um, the A'imma alayhum salam. So these books did not reach us directly. What happens is, is most of what we found in our books of hadith, where, for example, one of the scholars will be like, um, my teacher narrated to me from, 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 and then they'll go back to a companion, Imam As-Sadiq, it will be basically one of these books. And we know about them because the early scholars would mention, you know, their names and who the, um, and they'll basically mention the names of the book, what the book was about, and so on. So, for example, the first one is Kitab al-Salat. Most of our ahkam now regarding salah comes from this book. It's the book by Hariz bin Abdullah al sajistani He actually has a very unique story. I'll go into it in a second. Originally from Kufa, he was known to be... Um, um, it, it's mentioned, it's, I can't say that it's 100%. By, by the way, Sajistan is basically Sistan, where I say the Sistan is from, um, the, currently now. So it basically it says in some reports it says his father was a judge in Sajistan. Um, I haven't looked too much into it to verify it or not, but it's just information to be there. He's narrated, Sayyid al Khuti says he narrated, Hariz narrated over 1,300 narrations. But this book, Kitab al Salah, was a book that the companions, you, you know, now what, what do we do when we to pray to understand the hukum of praying, the Arkan al Salah, and so on? You go back to Risal al Amaliyya. Correct? The Ashab would go back to the, the book Kitab al-Salah by Hariz bin Abdullah al-Sajistani. Why? Because it became the famous book among them. Some of them, even um, we have scholars from the 4th and 5th century that will talk about um, studying the book. And in other uh, scholars, they would also mention that it was from the primary sources of the Shia. What am I trying to do here? I'm trying to give you examples of these type of books that did not reach us. Because these it's important that we understand how the culture of hadith reached us. Or the culture of how they transmitted knowledge to us. But to go to, um, just quickly as a side note, about this Hariz bin Abdullah Sajistani. And this is so you see what our righteous predecessors went through just so they can let the religion of Islam, the religion of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad reach us. It is said, it's mentioned in the books, that he is the one, him and his companions in Sajistan. So by the way, he was a oil and ghee seller. That was his business. He would go to Sajistan and he would obviously do business there. And of course, it's not like now, you know, you can catch a plane or maybe a train or something like that. It was hard. So when you go, you're probably staying at the city for some time. So it basically says he is the one that raised the sword against the Khawarij. But it's a um, interesting story because basically it said um, because the Khawarij kept on insulting Imam Ali alayhi salam, what Hariz and his companions did, it seems like they started to assassinate them at night. I don't know who's ever seen or watched the movie or played the game Assassin's Creed. It was something along them lines by the looks of it. They were, they were basically assassinating them one by one at night. And then the, the Khawarij was, of course, the powerhouse in the city. They were realizing, you know, they're, they're having a lot of people just getting killed out of nowhere. So what they did was they thought it was another group of people. If my memory serves me right. I think it was the Murjia. I think it was the Murjia. Anyway, one of the schools of thought or the, uh, a group of people that followed a specific type of school of thought. And it said they went after them. And then later on, they realized that, no, it's actually the Shia that have been assassinating them at night. And basically, um, or let's say in secret, assassinating them. And then basically it says they besieged them in, in their mosque. And then they broke all the walls down on them. And that's how they basically got killed. 
there's also reports where the Imam from Imam Sadiq where it seemed that he was very angry with Hariz um, because he um, you know lifted raised the sword to fight the Khawarij without the Imam's permission but that's a bit of a discussion we don't need to get into inshallah you have a second book by the name of uh, uh, the book Kitab al-Sunan wal-Ahkam wal-Qadaya by Abi Rafi, companion of Imam uh, of Rasulullah and Imam Ali alayhi salam. He's actually one of the people that migrated to Abyssinia with Ja'far bin Abi Talib and also to Medina. And he stayed loyal to Amir al-Mu'mineen after the death of Rasulullah. He was 85 years old. And he still stood with Amir al-Mu'mineen, no matter what. This book is a book of fiqh. It's a book that um, is, is regarding ahkam, matters of zakat, salah, psalm, and so forth. Again, why am I mentioning these type of books? I'm only going to give two examples here, because I want to get into the books that actually reach us. The books that we need to refer back to. Now, this book by Abi Rafi, he... Uh, um, the way that it reached us Or the way that um, Sorry, not reached us Because it didn't reach us But the way that it, it reached Some of the personalities That narrate about it Is that it seems like They would use it As a Like a risala amaliya That we have today And this is a Important factor to understand That these books The way that they used to do it is You have For example You have Imam al-Sadiq he narrates to his companion. His companion will have students who will be sitting down and then he will have his students and then he will be he will give a license to one of his students or a few of his students to narrate his ahadith. They will put it in their books and then he will have students and then it will continue to the one that um, compiled these narrations. So I'll give you an example. Our main book of hadith this is very important, brothers and sisters. Our main book of hadith is Al-Kafi. The author is Muhammad bin Yaqub Al-Kulaini Al-Razi. Okay, a fourth century scholar. Very important. If we don't know Al-Kafi, we're in a very bad place. Very bad place. Al-Kafi should be our culture. Al-Kafi should be what we, we have in every Shi'i household. Al-Kafi should be the book that we, after we finish with the Qur'an on our day-to-day -day reading of the Qur'an, is that we refer back to Al-Kafi. That's how important it is. Now, Al-Kulaini, he actually lived in the time of the minor occultation. So, Al-Ghaybat Al-Sughra. Um, and he, um, the book is in three categories. It's Usul Al-Kafi. So, by the way, it's been transmitted, it's on Thaqalain. All eight volumes are there. You can you can refer back to it. So usually the print is um, the way that it's been printed nowadays is that the first two volumes is Usul al Kafi, volume three, four, five, six, and seven is Furu al Kafi. Furu al Kafi. So matters of fiqh, business, marriage, divorce, zakat, psalm, all of these factors. Then you have Rawdat al Kafi. It's just a mixture of many things. Sira, Akhlaq, stories of the Prophet, stories of the Imma, Sira of Rasulullah, things like that. Please, brothers and sisters, do not waste your time going back to books that we don't even know where it came from. We have our primary sources, Al Kafi. You have to know Al Kafi. It's, it's so important. It should be a stamp for yourself. To, when you have the stamp of Al Kafi, that means. You're in a good place. You you know your imam. You're going back to the imma. Very important. Remember, what did we say in the beginning? We don't want to be those that went to the extreme. We don't want to be from those that hated Imam Ali. Now, this doesn't mean that within these books that I'm about to mention, that the books that have reached us, we um, that these books basically are infallible and we just take everything in there. No. There's a certain structure, a certain way that we deal with these ahadith. And those that are interested, and inshallah all of us are interested, we should actually study these different sciences. Then they have the second book <coughs> by Muhammad bin Ali bin al Hussein bin Musa bin Babawai al Qummi, famously known as Sheikh al Saduq. The book is called Man la al Faqih. So basically, 
um, one of the descendants of the Imam, he comes to Sheikh al Saduq and he says to him that there's a physician that basically authored a book called Man La Yahdarahu Tabib. So basically, translate for the one who the physician cannot visit. So if you're if you have this book basically in that time, and you get sick, you've got everything a, a nice guide to tell you. Okay, maybe you should drink this, eat this, do this to get better. So he basically told him we need something like that when it comes to halal and haram. So he authored this book, which translates to it translates it for the one the jurors cannot visit. So the one who the uh, you the one where you know you can't reach a faqir, but you've got this book. Everything in there is a guideline on how what ahkam to do on your day to day life. So Man La Yahbarahu Al Faqih by Sheikh Al Saduq. There are four main books of Hadith: Al Kafi, Man La Yahbarahu Al Faqih, and I'm about to mention the um, second uh, third book, Tahdib Al Ahkam, written by a scholar called Muhammad bin Al Hasan Al Tusi. A 5th century scholar, he died 460 after Hijrah. Again, he's from uh, born in Tus, the greater, uh, the greater of Khurasan. Um, and uh, he was born in the month of Ramadan. Born in the year 385. So this, what he did was, again, he compiled these, uh, this book in 10 volumes, or 10 volumes of what it is today. It has 13,590 ahadith very big book it's mostly um, fiqh and it's one of our primary our third most primary books now um, just like Sheikh al-Saduq um, he has I didn't mention it but I'll mention it just quickly he basically in in most of the book he doesn't have full chains so for example his chain going back to the Imam at the end of the book, he wrote a small book to basically explain. It's called al Mashaka to explain the his chains going back to the Imma to make it easier. Because you imagine at that time you're sitting there writing thirteen over thirteen thousand hadith. It's very difficult. the The fourth book, which is again the fourth book, is al Istibsar. This book is a bit different. It's basically a summary of Tahdib al Ahkam, his other book. It's it's uh, been authored by Sheikh al Tusi again. But it's a summary, so it's about four volumes. Basically, what it is, it's he in this book, his main goal, it was the main goal as well in Tadib al Ahkam, but this is more focused primary, primarily just on this, where he basically says Tadib is for. Um, so I'll quote the, the statement of a scholar. It basically is a, a number of books from Tadib al Ahkam. He's trying to show when there's a contradiction. How to deal with it. When two ahadith reach us and contradict, how to deal with it, what are the ways, and he tries to go through a very fiqhi, rigid kind of way to deal with it. Not something that will concern us today, but I just thought I'll mention it. We have a book called Kitab Al Mahasim by Ahmed bin Muhammad bin Khalid al Barqi. He comes from, a, he's originally, his family is from Kufa. He comes from an area called Barqa. Now, um, it's near Qum, and that's why they usually give Ahmed bin Muhammad bin Khalid al Barqi. So maybe if I lived in that time, they would say Hassan bin Ali al Qadri al Landani, like that, just to, so they people know. Because sometimes there's many Ahmed bin Muhammad, so like that, you know which one they're talking about. Um, it's a book basically, it's concerning not all of the book actually reached us, only two volumes. This book is very important because it's an early source. Um, there's many beautiful ahadith regarding fiqhi matters, regarding interactions, ethics, morality, things like that. It's a good book and I recommend, inshallah, um, when we translate it for you to read it. And if you can read Arabic, of course, go back to it, inshallah. We also have Kitab al-Tawheed by, again, who? The author of Man La Yahdarahu al-Faqih, Sheikh al sadu where he basically says, and he, uh, I'll give you the context of why he compiled this book it says he says he says this in the introduction of the book very important he says i compiled this book because the opponents of our sect allege that we believe in anthropomorphism and determinism so jabr so they used to basically claim that the shias believe in 
anthropomorphism, which basically means that Allah has a body. So he wrote this book to prove that that's not the case. We don't believe in Jabr in the way that you understand. And uh, he basically gives a, a complete understanding of Kitab al-Tawheed. Who here has heard of um, a book called um, Kitab al-Tawheed by Muhammad bin Abdul and Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab, the founder of the Wahhabi sect. So, and you hear a lot of um, those that follow that school, they always mention this book. When when you see that, remember, we have a book also called Kitab al-Tawheed, and alhamdulillah, it's not a book of extremism or anything like that. It's a book that guides you to true Tawheed and to understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do you have another book called Ayun Akbar al Rubal? Again by Sheikh al-Sadu. It's, it's a comprehensive collection focusing on Imam al Rubal alayhi salam. When you want to learn about Imam al Rubal, now you know. You go back to a book called Ayun Akbar al Rubal. Very important book. The, the, book. the narrations that are in there, it's from Imam al Rubal or from Imam al Rubal where he's narrating from his forefathers. And the book contains, it's, the subjects is Tariq, Sira, Jurisprudence, Theology, Ethics, Quranic Commentary. It's usually in two volumes. It's actually been translated and uh, it's found in, on Thaqalain as well. You have Ilal al Shara'a, which basically it's um, narrations from the Imma. It's a book authored again by Sheikh al Saduq. It gives you the reasons of, of, uh, of religious obligations and theological beliefs. For example, why do you do Hajj? It will explain it. Why do you fast? The, he, he's gathered all of the hadith that basically tell you the reason behind it. Ilal al Shara'i. You have the book called Al Khisal, again by Sheikh al Saduq. We want to refer back to these books. This is a very nice book because what he does is he categorizes the book in numbers. So any hadith that talks about one, he'll narrate it in that chapter. Any hadith that uh, discusses. Um, any ahadith that talk about anything to do with two things is under category number two. The another book by Sheikh Al Saduq called Ma'an Al Akbar, which translates to the understanding of reports. So in this book, it basically is a collection of ahadith from the Prophet and Imams on how to understand other reports. So, for example, when the Imam says, you know, uh, oh, this is a good example. For example, when there's narrations where it's been attributed to Rasulullah where he says, Allah is a sharp amrat. Or Allah um, is a beardless young man. You know, you, you, have, um, you have people that actually start believing this stuff. Some Shia started getting affected by this stuff. So when they came to ask the Imam, the Imam would say, for example, he said, no, this is not how it's understood. And he'll give an explanation to it. This is not like Allah doesn't have a body. He's not a beardless young man or anything like that. Allah doesn't have limitations. Allah doesn't have a time, a, a world that he just lives in. He's a completely different existence between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have thawab al-a'mal. So um, basically the thawab al-a'mal is narrations regarding the... It's narrations regarding... The consequences of good deeds and the consequences of bad deeds. Okay, so thawab al amal wa iqab al amal. So what happens here is you get all of the narrations. So you want to know if you fast, what is the reward for it? You find it in this book. But what's interesting, and to be fair, it's a point that Brother Haider uh, came up with a few years ago, but I think it's uh, praiseworthy to mention. It says the book contains three hundred. So the book contains 389 chapters on good deeds and their reward. And 131 chapters on bad deeds and their punishment. I'm showing you the mercy of Allah will always be far greater for us. And far more, there's far more doors to the mercy of Allah than there is to the punishment of Allah. Always remember that. Of course... Sin is a sin, but always remember that the mercy that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will have upon us. In certain reports it says even a mother is not even, it's, the mercy of a mother is not even 1%, not even a small 
it, it can't be even matched to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the mercy will have upon us um, compared to even the uh, mercy of a mother. Another book is called Sufat al Shia. Again, it's been translated. It's on, uh, my memory says right, it's on Taqalain. Um, it talks about the attributes of a Shia. Again, it's authored by Sheikh al Saduq. You want to know what, what it means to be a Shia? You go back to these books. Sifat al Shia. It tells you what characteristics and attributes you need to have. Um, another book is by Sheikh al Saduq is Kamal al Deen wa Tamam al Na'ma. It's a book, its main focus is to prove um, the existence of Imam al Hujjah, to prove um, his ghaiba, to prove the illa, so the reason of his ghaiba. So whenever you, you know you have questions or something to think about regarding Imam al Mahdi, go back to this book. Very important book because he also refutes um, the arguments of some Shia sects like the Zaydiyya. Um, he might even reply to the Kaysaniyya, those that believe that Muhammad bin uh, uh, Muhammad al Hanafiya um, was an Imam, one of the sons of Imam Ali. You also have Rijal al Kashi. Now, Rijal al Kashi is usually used when, when you want to authenticate hadith, but it's a book filled with a hadith from the Imma and the companions. But through this book, through this book, you actually learn about the Imams and the way the companions interacted. If you ask me, this is my favorite book of hadith because it's a book that um, really gives us a understanding of how the early Shias lived. We have it easy. Wallah, brothers and sisters, we have it easy. You could go on Google right now, write, you know, Thakalain or write sunnah.com or whatever it is, and you're getting all the ahadith right in front of you. These individuals had to go land to land and had to struggle, had to um, conceal their faith just so that they can go and learn from their Imam or their Imma it's very important that we know how easy we have it compared to them and remember that we are protected you know I'm talking especially us in the west you know nothing. what's, gonna, what's the most that can happen you know we, we can show that we're Shia these individuals had to go through so much struggle so that the hadith of Ahl al-Bayt get to us. So the least that we can do is appreciate them by learning about their life. And Rajal al-Kashi, or um, it's also known as um, Ikhtiyar Ma'rifat al-Rajal. So it's actually the abridged, the, uh, the actual author is Abu Amr, Muhammad bin Umar bin Abdul Aziz al-Kashi. But the Rajal al-Kashi that reached us was through Sheikh, Sheikh al-Tusi, the, the scholar that we mentioned um, earlier, the one that um, has the two books of the four main books, Tahdeeb and Al-Istibsar. And basically, um, Sheikh al-Tusi just summarized, let's say, there's a bit of a discussion, but we'll go with the famous opinion. He summarized um, al-Kashi and that's how it reached us. So it's important that we go back to these books. We also have Qurb al Isnad, but and the author is Abdullah bin Ja'far al Hanyal. This book um, is in three different categories um, from Imam al Sadiq, from Imam al Kadhim, and Imam al Ruba. There's a bit of a discussion is it the book of his son, his book? Some scholars might even discuss how the book actually reached us, is it authentic, and how it reached us. But generally, speak, generally speaking, a lot of what's found in there is beneficial. You learn akhlaqi matters, um, fiqhi matters. It's a good book to refer back to. And I would hope that most of us here can read Arabic and understand Arabic. And if you don't, remember, the key to reaching the Quran and Sunnah is Arabic. And if we don't know it, it's a problem that we have to solve. I, I, I was born in Sweden. I live in London now. I came to um, London when I was around six, seven years old. I didn't know how to read and write um, Arabic. I mean, my parents tried to take me to an Arabic school, but I was a bit of a naughty kid, so I kept on getting chucked out. But I was able, able to later on to learn Arabic on my own for six, in six months. Then I went on to study it with scholars and so on. So it, it is doable. We can all do it. Um, so Qurb al-Isnad, 
We go to the next one, Basar al-Darajat by Muhammad bin al-Hasan al-Safar. He is actually a contemporary of Imam al-Askari, alayhi salam. Some will even say that he's a companion of Imam al-Askari. So you imagine how old this book is. And the book, the content of the book is all about the attributes of the Imam, the virtues of the Imam, the merits of the Imam, and the high status of the Imam. Very good book to refer back to if you want to understand, have a real understanding of the Inna. Because like we said, we are trying to get back to Imam Ali, alayhi salam. And when we get back to Imam Ali, we need to know the real self, Imam Ali. We don't want to do taqsir and we don't want to go to the extreme. We want to have the middle ground. Another book, and I won't continue, uh, there's not many more left in, in case I'm boring you. You have the book Al Imama wa Tabsara min al Hira. Min al Hira. So it's by Abu al Hassan Ali bin al Hussein bin Musa bin Babawai al Qummi, the father of Sheikh al Saduq. And he wrote this book basically when the Imam went into Ghaybah, there was a lot of confusion uh, among the Shia. They were confused. So he wrote this book to basically um, answer all the doubts. And make the Shi'as understand the reason of the Ghaiba, prove the Ghaiba, the philosophy behind the Ghaiba, and the proof for the you know 12th, 12th Imam and everything regarding basically uh, Imama or the Imama of the 12th Imam or their Imma from before. It's a very good book to um, to have um, and a very good book to refer back to. It hasn't been translated, but inshallah soon. You have Kitab al Ghaiba by Sheikh Al Tusi again. This book is a book of hadith, but also a kalami book, a book of theology. You also have Al-Kitab Al-Ghaybah by Muhammad bin Ibrahim and numani The student of who? The compiler of Al-Kafi, Muhammad bin Yaqub Al-Kulayni. This one is mostly um, a hadith, but with some commentary from himself, uh, Muhammad bin Ibrahim. And then you have Kitab Al-Ikhtisas. This book... There's a bit of a discussion. Some attribute it to Sheikh Al Mufid, and um, there's a bit of a discussion of, of whether you can actually attribute it to Sheikh Al Mufid. Sheikh Al Mufid is a classical scholar uh, from the fifth century, a very important scholar. He met many of the classical scholars as well, and um, it's a good book to have, but I would say that, um, you know. Don't take everything in there. A lot of it needs to have, you know, evidences and proofs from other books to prove it because it's very hard to prove who the author is. You have Kitab al Jamal, the Battle of Jamal between Imam Ali, Talha, Zubair, and Aisha. Majority of the information you need will be found in this book, it's written by Sheikh Al Mufid. Very good book to have. It will be more considered as a book of tarikh rather than a book of hadith, but I would recommend it. Um, you do have narrations in there He's gathered as much as he can And if you want to understand the dynamics Of what happened in the Battle of Jamal Before and after and during the battle I would say refer back to this book inshallah A good book to have Kitab al-Irshad by Sheikh al-Mufid It's a biography of the 12 Imams Again he's a classical scholar Sheikh al-Mufid um, It's been translated I really recommend it Inshallah I've been bugging uh, Haidar to upload it to the Thakalain app But Still hasn't happened, inshallah, soon. What we, we, but you can buy it from Amazon, I think it is, and different places. Very good book. You want to learn about the Imma. And, and by the way, it's not a big book. So each chapter is about um, each Imam. And then you can, you know, go back to it to try and understand the seerah and the life of the Imam. Um, finally, we have a, a two more. Kitab Sulaim bin Qais al-Hilali. Uh, show of hands, who's heard of this book? Okay. So it's a book, basically, Sulaim bin Qais, he's a companion from Kufa, he's a companion of Imam Ali. He wrote this book, and it's a book um, where it discusses <clears throat> the primary um, aim or objective of the book is regarding what happened during the demise of Rasulullah, the death of Rasulullah, Saqifa, and all of the events that happened, so the event of the door, and so on. Again, we have two sides. You have scholars that absolutely reject it. They say that you can't attribute it um, or we, we don't have enough proof 
to say this is the same book the book the so the kitab sulaim that reached us we can't prove it is um, the book of sulaim bin qais al hilali there's been forgery that happened and and so on and you have the other side that say no it's an authentic book and um, it's one of our primary resources and so on but you imagine um even, let's say all of the shia scholars agreed on this book you have a book that reached us from the time of imam ali to now it's it, it's crazy to think about that you're you're getting information from that time from a person that's seeing everything that's asking in the book you see a lot sulaim will go to salman or go to um Adhidhar or imam al-hassan or hussein ask them what happened there what happened there he's, it's like he's investigating but like i said um some scholars see it to be very problematic other scholars don't you also have lastly there by the way there's a few other books but i thought i don't want to drag it on too much you have tafsir al-ayashi by muhammad bin mas'ud al-ayashi al samar qandi he converted to shiism he died in the year 320 after hijrah um it's a book of tafsir and it all it has all ahadith um basically explaining the quran from the uh, imma Again, some scholars have a problem with it because um, it doesn't have any chains. And most majority of the book, or I think maybe only two or three have, have chains, but majority of the book, most of it has no chains going back to the A'imma. So we don't know how these ahadith reached Al-Ayashi. Just to conclude, inshallah, um, forgive me if I if it was a bit boring and dragged, but um, I thought it was very important because I, I've, I've, I've seen that it's become a major problem in our community. That we follow Ahl al-Bayt not because it's fun, not because, um, you know, our parents taught us to follow Ahl al-Bayt. We follow Ahl al-Bayt because they are the best guides to Rasulullah and Rasulullah is the best guide to Allah. They are guiding us to the Quran and Sunnah. They are the protectors of the Quran and Sunnah, the true teachings of Ahl al Bayt. And they are the ones that will take us back to Imam Ali alayhi salam. Inshallah, you can remember me in these holy nights. Forgive me for any shortcomings from my side. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allah.